Okay. Hello again, everybody. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, whatever it is that you're watching this one. Um, great to be with you guys. And uh, today we just continue through the same sequence of lectures that you see listed in our course calendar and syllabus. So we're midway through our um, topic of abortion and the ethics of um, the moral controversy concerning, you know, pro-life versus pro-choice positions um, and this ethical debate. So I kind of want to start today by just summarizing some of the previous um, material and then also to give you some insight into um, how you might approach at least the first paper prompt now that we've talked about both uh, Marquis pro-life and Warren pro-choice. <coughs> um, one of the um, essay prompt options was to report on uh, Warren versus Marquis basically to state uh, Warren's pro-choice argument and her position then to lay out Don Marquis and his uh, pro-life position and his argument, and then to say afterwards what you think maybe that Marianne Warren might say in reply to the argument given by uh, Marquis. And uh, then in the end, of course, the final element of the essay would be where you would just state your own view um, using your you know own analysis and um, you know the best reasoning that you can offer. Now, about the papers, you know, uh, the format guidelines were all given in the uh, distributed document that I sent around. That's just 12 point font, uh, double spaced with normal margins, and um, uh, make sure that you just include some basic info on the front page, like your name and uh, the essay title. And um, it's good to have a page number in top right. Um, don't make the header, uh, or I should say, don't make the um, the font for the title extremely big or anything. Just make the same font as everything else so that you can get started pretty fast. Um, it's okay to have a kind of minimalist approach to the introductory and concluding paragraphs. Sometimes I even tell students you could just skip that and just focus on it as though it's a set of body paragraphs because we really care about um, not all the stage setting in the beginning or the um, summarizing at the end, but the major uh, meet in the middle where you're just making the argument and evaluating the um, material in the literature. But you can just kind of have a very short and to the point uh, intro and conclusion if you like. In philosophical writing, uh, you re really want to go for precision and clarity. You just want to prove and show that you understood the material and the uh, author's argument so that you could um, present it as though almost like a lawyer would present um, the facts of the case um, in a rational and kind of even-handed way. So strive for that level of clarity, um, and um, in a way, you don't have to write in the most uh, elevated prose or anything. This is more direct, straightforward, to the point. Just make sure the argument's clear and that you understood all elements of it and that you were proving that you did understand it in the way that you wrote. Now, um, about the authors and their arguments so far. We started this unit of the course on uh, the ethics of abortion by reading a, a classic paper from Mary Ann Warren, uh, from 1973, which is called On the Moral and Legal Status of Abortion. So as you remember, she's a pro-choice uh, philosopher, at least uh, she's a philosopher on many different topics, but her position in this debate was that she thinks abortion is morally permissible, and uh, she tries to showcase why, you know, in the, um, in the essay that she wrote. So the format of her argument is basically this. Um, we need to identify who or what are the things that have full and equal rights. Who are the beings that are the members of the moral community? Um, things that have rights like the classic rights of right to life, liberty, and happiness. Uh, obviously, some things are in that set of beings, like me and you. And then there are some things that don't seem to be in there, like maybe little bugs or maybe even farm animals that we use for meat. Um, if they don't have the same right to life that you and I have, and if you don't regard killing them as to be the same moral misdeed as having killed, say, an adult human person, then what uh, is the condition that makes something a member of that right-holding community. And uh, she suggests that it can't just be uh, anything genetically human because, after all, it's possible that there could be uh, beings with the same kind of um, potential and abilities as humans just without human DNA. Suppose there were intelligent life forms on other planets somewhere out in the universe. Then in that case, wouldn't those be capable of being members of the moral community too? So she poses the question uh, about what criteria make you a member of the moral community by uh, really focusing in on the concept of a person. She thinks it's all and only persons that are members of the moral community, rather than, say, uh, using the term genetic human being. Because as she points out earlier, uh, the word human being is kind of itself ambiguous. On the one hand, we sometimes say human to mean things that just have genetic 
uh, humanity, like they've got the DNA sequence of a human being. Um, but then on the other hand, we sometimes use it to mean, you know, members of the moral community who have rights. And she thinks that the, the argument given by pro-life advocates equivocates between moral and genetic human. But um, Marianne Warren then thinks it's really about being a person rather than being a, a human in whatever sense. So a person is something that you can determine the concept of by just thinking of what attributes uh, you would have to see in something before you thought that it was worthy of having rights like yours. Um, if you went to a space planet, she gives the hypothetical of encountering life forms there. And what, for example, would you determine or detect in them that might think, make you think twice about just I don't know, using them for food or for uh, fuel or resources or whatever? Well, <clears throat> suppose that they had consciousness and the ability to feel pain and, you know, they can think and feel. So consciousness is one. Um, uh, reason, so have uh, the ability to solve complica complicated problems and use rationality to that. Language and communication, like forming some kind of uh, speech or writing. Um, then there's self-awareness, knowing that the thing exists, and having self-motivated activity. If all five th of those uh, features were present in something, she thinks that we would consider it a person and think of it as a member of the moral community, whether it was a genetically a human or not. So that shows that genetic humanity is neither necessary nor sufficient for being a member of the moral community because some humans don't have all those features, right? So that would include the case of the fetus, and that's her major argument, that throughout pregnancy, the fetus does not have an appreciable measure of these five attributes to constitute personhood, and therefore it's still, as of that time period anyway, not yet a member of the moral community. If and when it acquires those things in the full course of its development, perhaps later, then it would become a person and would be endowed with rights. But prior to the establishment of the qualities of personhood, it doesn't have these features. Therefore, it's not a member of the moral community. So killing it is not the same thing as killing a person that has rights. It's killing a fetus, but that's non, it's a non-person human, uh, according to her argument. Now, she knows some people would point towards potential as being the uh, basis to deny that and saying that, well, maybe you're not a person today if you're in the womb, but according to you know her own criteria, you could think that this would be a person in the full course of time. So shouldn't potential be sufficient to render it a member of the moral community in advance of attaining personhood? To that, she raises another hypothetical, which is supposed to put pressure on that way of thinking. She says, well, if you were captured by beings that could convert you into like hundreds of thousands of them and make your cells become these persons from their species, uh, then wouldn't you have every right to deny them this opportunity uh, in order to preserve your own life or even just your own time or your own um, energy of whatever type. So if you agree to that, then she thinks you must believe that there's much different um, strength when it comes to the rights of either, um, you know, real persons that are actual persons versus potential persons. If it's 100,000 to one and you favor the right of the one to exist over the 100,000, then you must not really regard them as having the same level of importance. Um, then it was um, the writing of Don Marquis, okay? So Don Marquis uh, gave us a different view. Well, we also studied Thule, can't forget him. I, I wanna talk about the comparison between Marquis and uh, Warren, but um, let me come back, I'll circle back to Marquis in a minute so I can just give you the full on review of what we've done. I'll make short work of Michael Thule so we can get through that pretty fast. But Michael Thule is another of the pro-choice authors in the in the field. And he says that actually, uh, he also believes that abortion is morally permitted, but for a different uh, reason. He says, in order to have a right to anything, you have to be able to have interests. And in order to have a right to a specific thing, you have to have the ability to have an interest in that thing. So for me to have a right to, you know, marry, I would at least have to be able to understand what a marriage is. So like, you know, um, like a hamster or something could not possibly have such a right because it couldn't possibly understand the institution into which it was trying to enter. And, you know, like the same with the right to vote or to speech or to religion, you know? Now, uh, there, that is his particular interest principle, which he thinks most people would probably agree with after reflection for a moment. That is that in order to have a right R, uh, you'd have to be able to have an interest in R. So to have a right, a right to life then, plugging that in for R, uh, you'd have to have the ability at least to have an interest in continuing to exist, which means that you'd have to be able to think about continuing to exist as opposed to no longer continuing to exist. <clears throat> and um, as he sees it, that's actually a quite sophisticated concept to hold in mind 
because you have to really think in the abstract. You have to imagine yourself in the future potentially no longer existing, uh, which means that you would at least have to have some kind of working understanding of what mortality and death is. But at least throughout pregnancy then, the human fetus is not yet capable of entertaining these thoughts about its own future existence or non-existence. It hadn't yet emerged into the world, uh, so it certainly wouldn't have had yet the basis on which to generate those concepts. And therefore, since it wouldn't yet have the interest in its continued existence, Pooley thinks it wouldn't have a right to the same. Um, and he also has his own way of trying to contend with the uh, potentiality objection, but I'll leave that for uh, your notes and for the other video. So quickly then, I'm going to summarize the marquee, since that was the most recent piece, and then I'll try to do a little piece of uh, you know, commentary about how that can be compared with the argument from Warren, since the one prompt anyway is Warren versus Marquis, specifically. So um, Don Marquis, he wrote a paper in uh, 1989, and in that year, his paper is called uh, Why Abortion is Immoral. And um, he starts, so obviously that tells you in the title, right, that he's pro-life towards uh, the, the debate. He thinks that abortion is wrong and it's not morally permitted or that it's morally impermissible. And um, here's how he tries to make his case. <coughs> Sorry, a little slight cough. But he begins by talking about um, that the debate between the two camps, pro-choice, pro-life, it seems like it's um, in an impossibly... Um, irresolvable impasse, like there's just a standoff that cannot ever be um, re resolved, because you have, um, on the one hand, there's an argument given by pro-life, and then the other hand, there's an argument given by pro-choice, but they're very uh, similar in their logical structure, even though they're pointing towards different conclusions. They each make a descriptive and a normative claim. A descriptive is an is claim or statement. A normative claim is like an ought or value statement. Um, so saying that the sky is blue is just a descriptive claim, but to say that uh, blue is the best color is normative because it's a value judgment. Now, um, in the pro-life uh, argument structure, we have a format something like this. Um, beings which have this attribute P may not be killed, and fetuses have this attribute, whatever that thing is, therefore they may not be killed. On the pro-choice side of things, it's parallel, but the slight tweak, uh, which would be something like beings which do not have P may be killed, and fetuses do not have some attribute P, so therefore fetuses may be killed, morally speaking of the word may, um, in terms of like moral permissibility. So uh, the partisans of either account uh, attack the normative principle of their opponent, and uh, they only acknowledge the force of their own examples and intuitions, but deny the intuitive force of their opponents, uh, you know, counter arguments. So it seems as though the argument can't be resolved. But finally, he says, actually, there's a way out, uh, sort of. And that is to find something that both sides can agree on and work backwards from there. So the point of common agreement, he, he feels, is that we all at least understand and acknowledge that um, it's wrong to kill an adult human being, like one of you or I watching this lecture. So it's wrong to kill us. What makes it wrong? Let's answer that question, because at least we can agree on that one point, that uh, by the time you're an adult human being, certainly it's wrong to kill someone like that. So what makes it wrong to kill us? He says it can't be that it's because of the harm done to the killer, because sure, that's not so great, but uh, they're not really the victim, and therefore it's not the main thing that's bad about it. On the other hand, he doesn't think that it can be just accounted for by saying that it's all the harm done to the victim's loved ones and family members that have to grieve at their loss, because although that is very sad and it's a significant negative factor, uh, it doesn't generalize to every case, since after all, some people um, don't have loved ones uh, like that, and they live a homeless or even solitary lifestyle. Uh, that doesn't mean that they don't have the same right, uh, and that it's not just as wrong to murder or kill one of them. Um, so what's the real reason? And he points out what he thinks most would find obvious, that the real reason and the majority main reason that it's wrong to kill an adult is because of the harm done to the victim that is killed. They are uh, deprived of their entire future. And he puts a fine point on saying that we deprive this individual of their future by saying that <coughs> if it's an adult human being like you and me, a normal adult human being has a future, but not just any future, it's a future quote unquote like ours. Now that additional two words is doing a lot of work in his essay. By saying future like ours, he means the type of future that a rational human subject can generally experience out ahead of them. So think of your own future. 
as you think about the content or what he's referring to. A future with things like um, knowledge, um, interaction with technology, communication with others, the reading of books, the interaction with culture. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Allergies or something. My cat's been around here, but it's fine. So, yeah. Um, that kind of future is something that's special, it's unique, uh, and it's worthy of being protected. So he says, um, regardless of whether you call the fetus a person or not, or whether you talk about the interests that it has today or lack thereof, it does have a future like ours available to it. And that's why, um, you know, eliminating it through during pregnancy would be something tantamount to killing an adult person, whether they're an adult, a child, or any medium age uh, in between. Uh, they would have a future like ours in the ordinary course of time, and that's the thing that gives you these rights. This is a feature of the thing that he thinks is um, something found in humans, but it's not necessarily unique to humans. If there were other intelligent life somehow that could have that kind of future, then his view would hold it uh, you know, morally impermissible to kill or destroy them for whatever reason, because then they'd be members of the moral community as well as us. So he's not encircling genetic humanity as the distinctive feature, but rather the, the qualitative aspect of what kind of future that something can have. And um, if it's like ours, then it should be uh, um, within the sphere of the moral community. Now, uh, we have that kind of future, but at all earlier stages of our existence, all the way from conception until now, we've had that kind of future in potential. So, um, you know, the loss of the future is what makes the killing so wrong, and therefore he finds the same wrong-making feature in uh, the act of killing the fetus. So back to the prompt. If you were talking about, say, Warren versus Marquis, then you would have had both of those authors, obviously, that we've just reviewed in your paper. And um, Warren, you know, she's making her pro-choice position. You kind of heard the viewpoint and where it's coming from, that the fetus lacks personhood, and et cetera. And from Marquis' viewpoint, um, it's wrong to abort because the fetus has a future like ours, and just that much gives something the status of a member of the moral community. Now, having... Uh, heard about both views. Imagine Warren's response possibly to Marquis. I think that probably she would say this, um, that Marquis' argument sounds a lot like the potentiality objection that she herself um, takes on in her own paper. The potentiality objection is just the objection that doesn't the fetus have the potential to be a person or something like that, um, so why shouldn't it have rights before it acquires personhood? And she tries to, you know, dismiss the potentiality objection with her space explorer hypothetical that I kind of mentioned at the tail end of the summary and in the original lecture on her. So I think that it would be maybe wise to raise that if that was your paper topic that you chose to write on. You might say that Warren has considered the potentiality objection of an author like Marquis, and she doesn't find it convincing in her hypothetical or her thought experiment to try and reinforce that point is such and such, you know, so you might mention that. And then at the end, I mean, I don't know what your own view is, but when you do give your own view about whether you thought Warren or Marquis had the more effective argument, or if you chose the other prompt, of course, then it would be between Noonan and Thompson. But when you make your views clear about which is the better, um, you know, argument, you should try to make it rational. It shouldn't just be something that reflects a personal bias or a refusal to engage with the uh, evidence presented by the arguments themselves. So, you know, you shouldn't just say, I've always had this view and it's nothing that could ever be changed. Uh, I don't care what anybody writes. You know, I know a lot of these things are very um, somewhat, you know, they're, they're somewhat emotionally laden that people can have their own passionate views on it, which is fine. But you should at least strive to find a, a logical basis for your, um, you know, strong convictions if you have them. I'm not saying you do, but if you, if you do, you should be able to logically support them and not just appeal to emotion or to tradition or to, you know, other things that are external to the content of the arguments themselves. So that's great. Um, just my opening, you know, I wanted to spend the first moments of today's little recording just going over some of that stuff to help you as you prepare your essays, which, uh, you know, they'll be due next week. Okay. So today then we do have another um, author. I'm going to continue in the same order that you see listed in our syllabus. We have a few more um, pro-choice uh, and pro-life authors. Well, we have one of each. And um, we're finishing this unit with, with those two pieces. So one pro-choice, one pro-life author. This meeting right now, it's dedicated to the other remaining pro-life author that we will study. So this is John Noonan Jr. John 
Noonan Jr. It was actually John T. Noonan Jr., but no, either way, John Noonan. <coughs> so, this is a paper of his from 1970. And it's called um, An Almost Absolute Value in History. Okay, John Noonan Jr., An Almost Absolute Value in History from 1970. Noonan himself, um, he was a member of the judiciary for the most part. He served for a long term in um, one of the federal courts of appeal. And um, so he was a federal judge and uh, he lived a long life from 1926 to 2017. Uh, aside from his work as a judge, he also had a master's and a PhD in philosophy. So he's you know pretty well trained academically. And uh, he would sometimes publish articles on issues that were of interest to him, including this one about abortion. So he's writing this in 1970. At that time, of course, it's still part of the run-up to the Roe v. Wade 1973 Supreme Court decision. Uh, so there was a lot of debate ongoing at the time in society, in American society, about shifting um, legal landscape, and he wanted to weigh in. So he gives this argument, which, again, is going to be a more, it is a pro-life type argument. So his position is going to ultimately conclude that abortion's wrong, but uh, he doesn't just have a, a hunch or a feeling. He has an argument for it, so we'll try to see how he gets that view out. So let me tell you then, he basically just tries to argue in a straightforward type of way that the unborn fetus is a uh, human being with a right to life from the moment of conception onward. So that's his view. <clears throat> I'll just write a few notes as I go through this, some little things that might be... Uh, kind of just bullet points to, to focus on. So he says, Okay, so his view is that conception is when a human being acquires a right to life. At that event, at that moment, from conception onward, the human subject has a right to life. And as you know, conception is the first event in any human being's uh, term of existence when the uh, egg cell is fertilized by the, the, the male gamete, the sperm cell. And once that fertilization happens, you have the complementary set of gametes fused into his, uh, an embryo. And, um, you know, from that moment forward, he says, you have a member of the moral community of being that has the rights that we enjoy, inclusive of the right to life. Um, now, that obviously would imply that there's never a morally permitted abortion because there's no time period before the event of conception uh, in the course of existence. So some people try to locate the cutoff point, as it were, some time period later. Some people will say quickening is when the right to life is achieved, or some would say that it is viability when it is achieved. And then still others, like Warren or whoever, might say it is birth itself. Uh, or if you were Thule, you might even hazard the view that whether or not it's going to be legally permitted, it's morally acceptable for even some time period after that. But um, he's all, all the way back at conception, right? So he says, full stop, abortion is always impermissible. He sides uh, you know, with the perspective of someone like Marquis, but he gives a slightly different basis for holding this view. Now, that's obviously a crucial assumption or position to establish in a pro-life argument that the fetus has a right to life from conception. So what then can be said to defend this somewhat controversial uh, and, you know, fundamental position in the debate? He attempts to say, um, and he thinks that at conception, there's just this big change in the probability that the being will develop into a mature human. So he really uh, focuses a lot on this major shift in the numerical prob let me say that again numerical probability that the specimen will become a fully mature human being before conception the probability of an individual sperm cell for example uh, reaching the stage of mature adult human it's vanishingly small it's infinitesimally small 
But once the fertilized egg occurs, the odds are actually uh, quite favorable for the, um, at least down the line, uh, development of a fully matured human being. So that's the kind of um, preview of the paper, just to give you the big broad scope of it. But now we're going to go through some of the details in a little more um, piece by piece detail. So an almost absolute value in history. I think what he means by the title, anyway, it's gone from the board now. I think what he means by the title, an almost absolute value in history, is that this view that human beings have important rights uh, very early in their existence is something that he thinks has been historically well appreciated. Um, that's debatable, I guess, but that's his standpoint. So anyway, he starts with this question for the reader. How can you or how do you determine whether a being is a human being which has rights, like the right to life? How can you determine uh, whether or when something is a human with rights? Now, the position of the Catholic Church, and, and you know, for a lot of people who are just um, Christians of other faith, uh, like, you know, some Protestants, but definitely the Orthodox position, uh, official position of today's Catholic Church is that from conception, it's wrong going forward afterwards. And, um, you know, that's coinciding with his view that conception is what makes the difference. And he thinks that that cutoff point, <coughs> conception, right, the earliest one, he thinks that that's a much more attractive um, standard to hold about when the right to life is, you know, uh, triggered or when it comes to exist. He thinks that has much better basis than other cutoff points that it could be compared with. So this part of his paper is kind of interesting because what he's going to do is he's basically going to go on the attack against other later cutoff points. He's going to try and make the point that, uh, you know, if a person, say, thought that it was only when to become viable, that that's when abortion becomes wrong, like the view that would later be held by the U.S. Supreme Court, actually, for a generation, for 50 years. Um, but anyway, if that was the view, he says that doesn't have good logical foundations. Or if it was a quickening, if that was the cu a criteria or the cutoff point, he also says that lacks solid, reasonable foundation. So let me try and explain to you uh, some of the other cutoff points, which he finds fault with, and I'll just talk you through why. So um, Noonan finds fault with, like he doesn't agree with, um, other later cutoff points for the moral permissibility of abortion. The moral permissibility. Okay, so I just wrote that, this is just sort of give a heading to the current part of the paper that we're gonna go through. But it just says that Noonan finds fault with all the other or later cutoff points for the permissibility of abortion. So which cutoff point does he agree with? I don't know if it's even the proper term to call it a cutoff because there's no thing being cut since there's nothing before it, but he holds his, uh, he stands his ground with conception as being the distinctive, you know, morally significant event. But later cutoff points, so-called, he doesn't like any of them. So let's go through the ones that he finds fault with. Um, here's some of those other cutoff points. I'm just typing some of these in the chat now. Other cutoff points. Okay, so you've got, first off, let's talk about viability. Okay, so remember what viability is, guys? Viability is the uh, around the onset of the third trimester of pregnancy when the fetus, at least theoretically, or, you know, not even theoretically, but just, you know, within reason, it could survive on its own outside the womb, perhaps. Uh, given artificial uh, means of incubation, like a premature birth. So that's around the six-month pregnancy, onset of the third trimester. Some people say that this is when abortion becomes wrong. And what's the reasoning behind it? Let's think. Well, uh, one moral argument for why that should be a matter, an event that matters is that you could say the fetus is now, in a way, not as dependent, at least not in principle, on the body of the mother that's housing it. You might say that before viability is achieved, this fetus could not even survive outside of her womb. So it might be thought of as somehow coextensive with her own body at that point in time because it doesn't have its ability to independently survive. But take that last three months of pregnancy, right, when it's quote-unquote viable. 
If it was viable, that means that it doesn't necessarily need to remain housed in the mother's body to survive from this point going forward. And therefore, you might argue that now it has achieved a means of independence, at least plausibly or conceivably. <coughs> so now you might think <coughs> that no one has the moral right to deprive it of its continued existence, since um, although it's in their, her body as of yet, um, it didn't need to remain there to still survive. So it's independent in a sense, and therefore an independent being should be allowed to survive, and no one else should be able to make a choice whether it survives or not, etc. You know, But his view is that that's actually a bad argument. And uh, what he says is this. The reason it's such a bad argument, in his opinion, is that if you think about it, there is no actual significant change in the level of dependency that the so-called viable fetus has versus the pre-viable fetus, meaning the fetus before the event of viability. So there's actually no significant lessening of dependence, which is what the whole basis of this cutoff point was supposed to be um, centered around. <coughs> Sorry. So for example, um, answer this question if you can while you're watching. How old do you think a human being would have to be before it could survive on its own completely without any assistance from anyone else? You know, so left to its own, this human being at this age is capable of survival. Um, is it a six-month-old um, developing fetus? Definitely not, because if that thing was left on its own without the help of a very sophisticated medical team and hospital apparatus, it would definitely just die. Uh, but what about even a baby, you know, a baby uh, that's three months, six months, nine months, a year? Uh, it can't feed itself or find the means to sustain itself without a lot of human assistance. And that goes on for years and years. Um, some people might say that, you know, you're really not capable of being totally self-sufficient of well into your childhood or even adulthood. But at any rate, it definitely is not yet achieved throughout pregnancy, nor is it achieved for a significant time period afterwards. So that's why he says viability even if it does point to an event where, or a, a phase of pregnancy, if you want to call it that, where the fetus technically could survive uh, without the assistance of the mother's body, it's not in any significant way independent. And so thinking of it as something that's independent and therefore um, uh, now worthy of moral protection as opposed to before, it seems that he doesn't think there's any significant difference there in the so-called before and after of viability. There's there's no true depend there's no true independence before it, yes, but there's also no true sense of independence after it, aside from this very technical and minimalist idea of being quote unquote independent. One thing that I think is interesting as he attacks these other cutoff points is that in some sense he almost sounds kind of like uh, you know how some of the pro-choice authors are. Because they disagree with these cutoff points, but for a different reason, you know, they would probably also say no, I mean, viability is not the right cutoff point. But that's because they think that even post-viability, abortion should be permitted. So they think this is not a significant event it's because they think the real cutoff point is birth. And uh, in his view, it's also the wrong cutoff point, but it's only because it's too late. It's way after conception. So the two sides can shake hands on one thing, which is that they both agree that this might not be the right cutoff point. If you're, say, Warren, you think it doesn't matter whether it's capable of surviving in an incubator. It's still not going to be a person either way. Or Thule saying, you know, it doesn't have desires yet or even the ability to form these future-oriented desires. So he would disagree with that being the right cutoff point, but because he thinks it's further out ahead. And, uh, you know, a guy like Noonan would disagree with it for the opposite reason because he thinks it's too late in the process. Okay, so that's what he says then about viability and his rejection of it as the correct cutoff point or standard. Then, uh, <coughs> so, let's try another one. What about um, experience? Now, I want to say this. Um, some of these um, cutoff points that he talks about, in my opinion, he's almost choosing them in a way that it's like a straw man. If you don't know, the word or term straw man is a type of logical fallacy of argument. And straw man fallacy is when you take your opponent's real position and then you misrepresent it or distort it so that it sounds worse, therefore easier to refute or to rebut. You know, So it would be like if somebody said to me um, – you know, I think a border wall is a too expensive uh, a, a, of a project, and it's not got proven evidence to um, to stop the flow of drugs or illegal immigration. So I think it's just unwise as a policy. And then I reply back to them by saying, "Oh, so you don't think that we should have any border controls at all? 
Like if I said that, that would be me mis misrepresenting what they said because they didn't say let us just uh, discontinue all border controls, but just that maybe a big costly physical barrier is not necessarily the best way to achieve our goals. So when I misrepresent my opponent's position, like in that you know weird little example I just gave, I'm committing a straw man fallacy. Straw man, think scarecrow, which is like a decoy for um, scaring away crows and other predatory birds from a person's crops. Uh, they see the fake man, the scarecrow, and they, they run off. In the same way, uh, when you have an opponent making an argument and then you misrepresent them so that the fake version of their argument is easier to retaliate against, you're uh, attacking not the real person's argument, but the scare man, it's the scarecrow straw man version of it, right? So that's the basis of the metaphor behind the uh, phrase. Anyway, I was just raising that because I feel that like in one sense, you know, I'm being fair to Noonan, but I also think that sometimes he um, commits a bit of a straw man in some of the parts of this essay. Because when he calls out some of these cutoff points that he doesn't like, some of his critique makes sense to me. Like this one about viability I thought was pretty strong. But he also criticizes certain cutoff points that I don't think anyone from the pro-choice side actually um, articulates or argues for. So it's almost like he's ascribing to pro-choice uh, authors views that m most would not say they really do hold. Um, as an example here, he says... What about experience? So that's another so-called cutoff point, at least in his uh, way of describing it. So what he's saying here is if you think that it's only once you start having experiences that you have a right to life, he's ready to push back against that too. Why would experience be the correct criterion? Well, he gives what I find to be a pretty um, awkward um, – hypothetical to use to defend this point. So let me pass it on to you. He said, um, suppose that someone ha suffered amnesia. So some incident happened to them and then after it, they lose all of their memory of their life before. So they can't tell you basic facts like where they were born or like who their parents are or you know what they did for a living or like where they went to school. So their memories wiped clean. I mean, they're still rational and they have language and they're you know thinking clearly, but they just can't remember anything. So they've lost all their experiences in this hypothetical, right? They just don't have those experiences anymore, or they can't retrieve them from memory. He says, but wouldn't they still have the right to live, and wouldn't they still have all their same rights? So the fact that they lost their experiences, why should that deny them any rights? This is one way that he tries to you know, make his case, that experience cannot possibly be the factor which gives you rights, because if it were, then we would have to say in this strange hypothetical about the amnesiac that they don't have rights, which doesn't sound right or it doesn't sound correct. But uh, here's my view on his example. I think he's kind of making abuse of the concept of not having experiences because the amnesiac person, if they're an adult anyway, uh, you know, if they're a mature human being, they're going to be able to have new experiences now. So it wouldn't really matter that they lost their memories. I think he's kind of equivocating here on the idea of having new experiences versus having, uh, you know, psychological access to the memory of your past experiences. But anyway, such, it, such as it is, that's one of his you know, examples to illustrate his point here, that uh, experience can't be the right cr criteria to distinguish when you have a, now acquired a right to life, because there are some individuals that might not have such experiences, but don't they still have rights? Um, <coughs> another cutoff point that he talks about is sentimental attachments of adults. Um, on the experience point, before I move on, and it's going to be kind of linked to this current little uh, back and forth as well, but um, I told you that I think there's sometimes when he slips into a slight like straw man mode of argument, and I think with the experience thing, that's what's one of the cases of that, because again, if you read the more sophisticated arguments from the pro-choice side, they don't say something as um, as basic as that, like, oh, well, what, don't, don't you need experiences to have a right to life? The fetus doesn't have those, so it must not have these rights. Normally, it'll be something much more um, involved, like, no, it has to have personhood, and then some argument is given as to what constitutes it, like you saw from Warren, or no, it must have some self-aware appreciation of its future-oriented interests, or the interest in even living, um, like what Thule had said, and you talk about then what it takes to have desires, and so forth, um, that are oriented toward the future, but most would never have said something as, you know, uh, blunt and flat-footed as, you need to have experiences, so I think that in a way, although he's responding to some potential argument, it's not an argument that really many pro-choice 
advocates would probably appeal to themselves. But yet now we hear about a third cutoff point, and you see it there, sentimental attachment of adults. Now I find this one again to be perhaps reaching into the whole straw man bag because, again, it's like who has ever said that that's the basis on which abortion is morally permitted because parents don't have enough of an emotional connection to the fetus versus, say, when it has been born. But anyway, he's really setting it up here for uh, an easy you know, rebuttal to just knock out of the park. I'm sure that if you're watching this and just thinking for a second, you can probably imagine – why it's probably not a good basis to deny something having rights, including the all-important right to life, just because you don't have sentimental feelings toward them. Uh, because as he points out, you know, historically speaking, there have been a lot of terrible episodes in both modern history and in world history where uh, a whole you know, group of human beings were dehumanized and uh, eliminated, sometimes by genocidal means from society, because people didn't feel you know, uh, any sentimental attachments to them. <coughs> so whether it would be like, say, the Holocaust or, you know, other um, episodes of genocidal, um, you know, extermination of people, uh, why should we give license to the view that you only are a member of the moral community if, if some other uh, group of adult beings, you know, cares about you? <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, but anyway, I mean... Uh, again, I think that in a way it kind of confuses the issue slightly to raise that for two reasons. <coughs> First of all, sorry, um, I don't think anybody has made a serious argument on the other side that uh, that it's only when people are directing, you know, emotional uh, attachment toward you that you have these rights, you know. Um, so he's kind of, again, taking on a view that is probably not in the mainstream of most people's thinking on the pro-choice side. But then also, uh, so to the second point, um, when you say that, okay, well, people didn't have feelings during the time of slavery for those that were living in slavery, or maybe people didn't have feelings towards, you know, um, I don't know, other, other marginalized and dehumanized uh, religious or other minorities throughout history that were persecuted. Um, but the beings with whom you're not having feelings towards in these cases uh, are not the same kind of individual as a fetus. So um, you know, they're obviously adult human beings with a uh, complete rationality and complete personhood. So I feel like it's a strained metaphor or analogy, but, you know, such as it is, you, I think, hear the basics of his point. So let me summarize where we've come so far. <coughs> okay, let me take a little sip of this water. Just had a bit of a scratchy throat today. It's fine, though. It's dry weather. Okay, cool. So, um... Looking at the big picture of today's, you know, lesson on this, he starts by saying, um, conception is what it's all about when, when we're talking about the right to life. For a human being, once you're conceived, once that sperm fertilizes that egg, you know, it's on from there. Now you have all these rights. You have a right to life. If you're killed, if you're aborted at any time after that, that's like murder because you get the right to life straight away from the beginning. Now, other cutoff points are mentioned. You can see some in the chat. He doesn't agree with these other later ones. Viability, he's like, why should that make a difference uh, when you're able to survive outside the womb, like technically speaking, because you're not even really independent anyway, even after birth happens. So if we're waiting until you had independence, that's certainly not even throughout pregnancy or some time period afterwards. So that can't be the moment when you achieve these rights. Um, experience, he says, well, you know, what about the amnesiac? They might not have their experiences or they couldn't remember them. And why should it matter whether you can have experiences, whether you have these rights? Although it's a bit of a misapplied, uh, you know, analogy, I would say there's that point. And then we've gotten to sentimental attachments of adults. You know, if your membership in the moral community depends on whether other people direct sentiment toward you, then that really uh, opens a dangerous door uh, to giving some kind of moral legitimacy to episodes throughout the past and even somewhat times in the present uh, where marginalized groups were dehumanized and therefore denied rights, and that can't be good. Uh, he also rejects quickening, so that's just another one. <clears throat> he thinks that quickening is not the right criteria either. Quickening is that point in pregnancy somewhere around like the fourth and fifth month where you can start to feel the fetal movement in the womb. Um, the mother can anyway. She can detect fetal movement. Sometimes they call that kicking, but whatever the movement is, that's quickening. And some people, and including in the original American law and in the British common law before it, they thought that was the key event that starts to signify the holding of these rights, like the right to life. 
But he also finds fault with that. He says quickening seems to be somewhat of a of a, like a, a holdover from the hi historical relic era of um, thinking about insolment, you know. And he thinks that the scientific and just uh, you know philosophical basis for thinking of insolment as the key moment in time is just not really there. Um, Furthermore, on the point of quickening, I mean, obviously there's a, a whole bunch of other life forms that also achieve that point in pregnancy, and we don't think that they have any special rights only on that basis, so it can't just be the movement itself. Um, and, you know, to the extent that quickening is when you can feel it moving, why should your ability to detect smoke movement be the kind of standard bearer for whether it has these rights? Another one that he does reject is membership in society for another, I would say, obvious possible reason. Obviously, membership in society can't be the correct uh, cutoff point. And once again, uh, this is a view that I don't think very many have actually stood behind, but he wants to take it on anyway, that that being the idea that abortion is okay because you're not yet fully a member of society until after birth happens sometime later. Then you become a member of society. Then we count you as one of us, and you have all the same rights as the rest of us. But he also doesn't like this view for the obvious reason that it seems willing to approve of the dehumanization of social outcasts or uh, groups in society that are socially uh, excluded. So in the end, he says, what is the key correct criterion or cutoff point? And it's the one that we mentioned uh, at the start, which is conception itself. Um, he accepts this and he says the reason is not for an arbitrary reason. He says conception is the only one of these different so-called cutoff points that corresponds to a real change in the nature of the situation. Because in his view, that's the point at which the probability that a being will reach the status of a mature adult human kind of explodes. Like that's the point where the probability there just leaps up by leaps and bounds. So let me just show you a little bit of some of the numbers that he's playing with here. And, uh, you know, I have my own critique of some of the use of his statistics and data here. But, you know, to be fair to him, I want to get you his view. In his way of looking at it. So let's ask, what is the probability that a single sperm in a normal sperm sample would be successful in fertilizing an egg and then that that egg would eventually fully um, you know, develop and down the line turn into one of us, a mature adult human being? So probability of a single sperm um, becoming a, a mature adult human being. Okay, so I'm just writing probability that a sperm cell within a sample will become a mature adult human. It's one out of 200 million. Almost ran out of space on the board, <laughs> but that's nine zeros, or sorry, I meant to say eight zeros there. One over 200 million. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight zeros, then two, that's 200 million. Um, and that's a very, very, very small probability. So if there was like one sperm cell, right, floating around in a sample of sperm, um, and you're wondering how likely is it that that randomly chosen individual sperm cell, we're not talking about the whole sample, but just one of the sperm cells inside it, what's the chance that that would be the one that somehow succeeds in fertilizing the egg in the end and then, you know, germinating and turn, turning into over process of pregnancy and so forth, a mature human being like you and I are today? And the odds are quite small. It's one out of 200 million. But what about the probability that a fertilized egg that has now you know, undergone conception, post-conception, what's the probability that the fertilized egg will mature into an ordinary adult human being? And the odds there are quite good. It's four out of five. It's four fifths. So I'll put that in this chat here. And that is four out of five. Four out of five is, you know, just looking at it in a different way mathematically, it's 80% probability. <coughs> so that's a major shift, at, you know, as he's trying to point out before and after this event. 
before conception happens, there's nothing there yet that has any high likelihood per, per se of becoming a human person. At that point, you have eggs and you have sperm that are not yet mingled together. And the sperms, any single one of them taken on its own, has just a vanishingly small chance of becoming the successful progenitor. And the egg is not yet fertilized, so um, its odds can't be measured really. But then you have the fertilized egg. And um, the fertilized egg, you know, it's a quite likely proposition that it would become a person in the ordinary course of time. So he, like, really leans in on this. Uh, he's trying to present them in the before and after of conception. And he thinks this is the only one of these so-called cutoff points where you see some kind of, like, hard, even he wants to construe it as mathematical evidence um, for a change in the nature of the process. So this is what he calls an objective discontinuity uh, from before and after, and that's the foundation of the moral judgment that abortion is wrong. Now, he says that um, the odds that he's talking about require us not to abort because the fetus that's now been fertilized, you know, the egg that's been fertilized, now becoming a fetus anyway, um, it's likelier than not in uninterrupted course of time that it will become a mature human being. Now, what if the probability was much lower? What if a fertilized egg only had like a one out of a uh, hundred chance or a one out of 20 chance of eventually becoming um, a human person? Uh, one out of 20, one out of 50, one out of a hundred, he thinks. In that case, you know, your view might be a little bit more citing on the pro-choice that, well, who's to say this really would have even become a mature human being anyway if you abort it, you know, in the one out of a hundred scenario. It's like 99 times out of a hundred, you're aborting something that wasn't going to become a person anyway. Or even in, let's say, the um, one out of 20 scenario, you could maybe make that case. You could say, well, odds are still overall pretty low that the fertilized egg will reach maturity. So when you abort, what's the chances that you're aborting anything that was really going to become a person? But when it's four out of five, he thinks uh, that means that in the more likely than not scenario, you did abort something that would have become a full mature human had it not been aborted. He gives this analogy. He says, suppose that you're firing the gun into a bush where you saw the bush move a little bit. And you're like, oh, damn, poop, <laughs> you shot at it. Now, um, what if you thought that there was a one in, uh, one in a thousand chance that that was a person in the bush? You might not hesitate too much and just pop off and shoot. But if you thought there was a four out of five chance that it was a human being in there, uh, you might say, okay, I got to wait, or like I need to be, be a little more careful because the high chances are that I'm killing a person here rather than low chances. Now, I think it's a bit of a, uh, a little bit of a deceptive piece of reasoning. I just want to make my own points here for, for a moment. One thing I do take a slight exception to is this. He points out these numbers that he chooses. Um, as though they're part of one continuous process, right? Before conception, one over 200 million. After conception, four over five. Wow, what a big shift in the same process. But hold on. It's, it's not really the same process. That's where I kind of find fault. You know, before fertilization of an egg happens, there's no pregnancy that is even started yet. So I look at a sperm by itself, and I think that it has, without the supplement of the egg cell, clearly, it has what probability of becoming a mature adult human? Zero. Zilch, big goose egg, has nothing because on its own, as you know, sperm is never going to create a, a human being at all. Uh, it has to have that egg. So um, it's, I think, a little bit playing with numbers, right? Fudging the numbers to attach this numeric value to it, which of course is going to create some kind of rhetorical effect of looking dramatically smaller than the four out of five figure that he asserts once fertilization happens, you know? So the other thing too is, by choosing the uh, individual sperm cell, that also plays with the numbers because, you know, in a single sperm sample, there's there's hundreds of millions of individual sperm cells. So the probability that the entire sperm sample will fertilize is significantly higher than the probabilities associated with a randomly chosen individual sperm from the sample. So I think also that helps him construe the odds as exceptionally low, but it's kind of like in a way, um, you know, misapplying the statistics since he's choosing only one out of a larger number where there always is this larger number in the actual case. And then the other thing too is um, he chooses the male gamete where, as you know, with sperm, there's millions and millions and millions of those in a single sample, but uh, the female egg ovulates and there's only like 390 or so of them for a woman's entire life. So had he chosen the egg as his you know, um, example to go to, the numbers would have looked much different and he wouldn't have been able to say one over 200 million, but he would have been able to say at most, you know, I don't know, like one over 400 um, or maybe some other number, um, you know, but something certainly well short of 200 million. So I think that helps him to make his case only by 
uh, deceptive outward appearances because he's now able to construct such a small fraction. Um, and he also makes it appear to be as though one and the same process. But anyway, <coughs> switching hats back to, you know, <coughs> giving the affirmative argument for what he said, um, his kind of final thought on this is that once you have the full human genetic code, you know, you've got the genetic information from the male gamete, the genetic information from the female gamete, now we have a fertilized egg, that's conception. At that point, he says that the being is a human, and it is a, a, a human being that's a member of the moral community with full and equal rights to all the other humans that are in that same community. And so he would say at that stage, since it has a right to life, it's the same like your right to life. I don't have any right to end your life, uh, even if I thought it was for your own good. You know, what if I thought, oh, man, you got a terrible terminal illness. You know, your life's really going to be a lot of pain going forward. So just for your best interest, I'm going to kill you in your sleep and you'll never know it better. But don't worry, I'm taking your best interest to heart. Obviously, you would say, no, that's not OK, because whether or not I had a reasonable basis to think that it's your life and you're the only one who has any you know, fair um, standing to judge whether it ought to continue or not. So in the same way, you might say, if I'm a human being and I'm thinking of aborting this fetus, if it's got a standard, sorry, if it has a, uh, a status that is equal to all the other members of the moral community, like adult humans, then I couldn't make a decision on its behalf. Like, well, you're going to live a life of poverty or you're going to live a life with a broken home or you're going to live a life where your parents, you don't know who they are because they've got to give you up through adoption or whatever. Any of these reasons that appear to be altruistic toward the fetus, he would say they're not valid, though, once we're talking about life itself, because the right to life is such that I cannot revoke your uh, life um, on the basis of my individual assessment of whether, you know, it's in your best interest that it continue or not. Um, so, again, you can't end someone else's life for their own good um, or for your sake, because it's wrong to do that to adults without their say, and the same would hold of the fetus. Now, there's still this one exception. Um, even his argument allows one exceptional circumstance where abortion might be permissible. I'll give you a second to think about what you, what you believe it might be. But, uh, you know, the answer is not too far away, um, I'm sure, if you're thinking. The one exception that he does feel could be mentioned for even, um, you know, his own position, you know, that it's conception, which makes the big difference, is again to the case where the mother's life uh, would potentially end by carrying the pregnancy full term. Uh, if it's going to end her life to pursue the pregnancy till delivery, then she doesn't see why we should have any basis to prefer the life of the mother over the fetus. But he does go a little farther than Marquis, who just simply left it at that and said, when her life's at risk, um, it creates um, an exception to the general case. Because this author, Noonan, says that, well, you know, if she wants to sacrifice to the point of death um, for the sake of the fetus, not that she has to, but he also says it's not wrong if she wants to do that. In fact, he almost says it's like a praiseworthy thing, almost an imitation of the example of Christ, you know, who famously uh, died on the cross for everybody's sins. And therefore, he's like supposed to be this model example of um, sacrifice to the point of death for others whom you love. So a woman that chose to do that in order to preserve the life of the fetus, even at the cost of her own, you know, he doesn't want to say that that's actually wrong, even if it's not something that she's obligated to do. So he kind of exposes a little, he kind of shows his hand a little bit at the very end here about there's like a Christian basis to his thinking kind of lurking in the back, background because he starts quoting out some scriptures and talking about views from the Bible. He says here, um, the perception of the humanity of the fetus and the weighing of fetal rights against other human rights constituted the work of moral analysis. But what spirit animates these judgments? For the Christian community, it was the injunction of scripture to love thy neighbor as yourself. The fetus as human was neighbor. His life had equality with your own. That commandment gave life to what otherwise would have only been a rational judgment. So it's like also based on some kind of religious um, attachment to the idea of loving your neighbor as, as quoted by the scriptures. <coughs> he says, and suppose you're more secular and you don't follow the Bible as your primary source of morality. He says, well, in humanistic terms, it would be do no harm to your fellow man without valid reasons. Um, in these terms, once the humanity of the fetus is pursued, perceived, sorry, abortion is never right except in self-defense. Now we get to the self-defense exception, so to, so to speak. It says, when life must be taken to save life, reason alone cannot say that a mother must prefer a child's life to her own. With this exception, now of great rarity, abortion violates the rational humanist tenet of the equality of human life. So he says, with this exception, but it's very rare, you know, it could be permissible morally for the abortion to be performed if it's like a self-defensive act to save the mother's life. 
But he also sees here, uh, in the light given by the example of uh, the Lord, uh, self-sacrifice carried to the point of death seemed in the extreme cases not without meaning. So there's a commandment to love in the Christian tradition, and he says if love was uh, expressed by a mother, you know, laying down her life for the sake of her fetus, it's not that it's something that should be considered wrong. But of course, um, you know, he's got his view there. Um, and in a way, I think that his view kind of is, in a sense, uh, a bit simplistic. It's just conception makes all the difference. He places a lot of emphasis on this probability changing before and after the event of conception. Um, so most of his arguments, affirmative basis is on that grounds. And his critical uh, remarks are usually directed at how other cutoff points can't bear all the weight of this moral distinction of you know, having a right. Um, but I've talked to you about some of the areas where I found fault with him, and um, we only have one more author now to kind of complete our uh, set of notes and less lessons on the abortion literature. So uh, go ahead and get ready to watch the next lesson because the uh, next episode is all about Judith Jarvis Thompson. And with that, we'll be completed our uh, you know whole course unit. Judith Thompson is another pro-choice author, and uh, in one of the essay prompts that you could write on, it's not just uh, Marquis versus Warren, that's one option, but the other one is Noonan versus Thompson. So now you've learned about Noonan, and you're just waiting for that last piece. If you choose to write on the Thompson versus Noonan paper, then definitely you'll want to follow that next lesson so that you can compare and contrast uh, this man's work against uh, Judith Thompson's work, which is also really good and very interesting um, detailed argument that she lays out. So I'll leave you for now. I'm going to try and keep these lessons, you know, generally between like, say, close to an hour to maybe like an hour and 15 so that none of them are, you know, overwhelming length or too tedious for you to watch or at least watch large sections of all at once. So stay tuned. I am posting that one and um, you can continue to watch and you'll get to see what Thompson has to say. Then you can choose between either of the two essay prompts, whichever one, you know, suits um, your interests or um, in, in, insights the best. So for now, guys, uh, wishing you all very well. Thanks again for taking the time to watch this. Um, and uh, have a great one. I'll see you soon. Thanks.